Good day, dear viewers of the YouTube channel of the magazine International. Here is Fritz Edlina again. Today we are having a conversation with a young colleague from Austria, Dieter Reinisch. A warm welcome to you, dear Dieter. We will discuss an experience he personally had a few days ago. It's about a conference in Berlin on the topic of the Palestine-Gaza War. This conference was dissolved by a special unit of the German police or army two hours after it opened. More on that later. To start our conversation today, it perfectly complements our last discussion, which we published two days ago. That was the summary of a discussion that our Swiss colleague Pascal Lothars, who works in Japan, had with a German and a Swiss media scientist and social psychologist Harald Welzer and Leo Keller. They reported on a scientific study that has already been published. The result of this study showed that the leading German media in their reporting on current international topics, such as the Ukraine war or the Gaza war, often stand in contrast to the social scientifically recorded attitudes of the German population. A provocative thesis from Professor Welser in our conversation two days ago was that the leading German media try to make the war in Ukraine palatable to the German audience by suggesting that this is the only sensible solution. This is a small example, and today's example aims to use an event from one or two days ago to try to provide proof or at least indications that there are indeed obvious contradictions in Germany. These exist between the political, governmental, media leadership, and the audience. The leaders in politics and media are now resorting to methods with which they want to enforce their opinions. As can be seen from the first reactions after this interview, Convention in Berlin, these methods are in stark contradiction to the German constitution, especially to the fundamental provisions regarding freedom of speech and democracy. Dieter Reinisch was at this conference, which started and then was interrupted and cancelled. First of all, I would suggest, Dieter, tell us how the events unfolded there in Berlin. Yes, thank you for the invitation. As I said, I was in Berlin over the weekend to report on the conference. A lot has happened, on different levels, which is just really scandalous overall. This concerns both the behavior of the authorities in terms of reporting, and the repression and aggressiveness of the police in Berlin. I'll get to that later, but let me start chronologically to recount the weekend and describe the various incidents. So, I arrived on Friday morning directly to the press conference, which took place in the wedding district, north of the main train station. As I was driving to the press conference in a taxi, there was already a significant police presence on site. Additionally, there was a pro-Israeli counter-demonstration. A group of 20 to 30 people with Israeli flags was located not far from the press conference. This took place in an office of a solidarity group for the Global South. It is also important to mention that the two main organizers of the conference were Jewish Voices for a Just Peace and Diem 25. The latter is a new party that is also running in the EU elections and includes the former Greek finance minister, Yanis Varoufakis. I believe it is also important to know that, when looking at the reactions in the media, and also those of the German interior minister Nancy Faeser, it is important to say who the organizers were. The press conference was overcrowded with media representatives, including many German media, such as RBB, Deutsche Welle, Deutschlandfunk, ARD, ZDF, but also numerous international media, especially from the Arab world like Al Jazeera, as well as Turkish agencies and online newspaper editors. New Arab, for example, was represented, as well as media from Hong Kong, Spain, including the new channel Canal Red and the newspaper Diario Red. The atmosphere at the press conference was extremely hostile, characterized by intrusive questions from the German media. 
Enorm. Es waren aufdringliche Fragen von den deutschen Medien. Es ist eigentlich nur darum gegangen, warum darf die Springer Presse nicht da sein? It was actually just about why the Springer Press was not allowed to be there. The discussion mainly revolved around the question of why journalists from the Springer Press were denied entry, which happened due to their enormously biased reporting. They had been writing about an anti-Semitic Congress weeks in advance. So at its core, that was all the journalists were concerned about. As you already mentioned, the question was asked by a colleague from the German media, Anne Wieland Hoban, who is a Jewish composer and actively participates in Jewish Voices for a Just Peace. She was one of the conference's spokespersons. During the press conference, she asked, are you an anti-Semite? Die haben einfach bei der Pressekonferenz gefragt, sind sie Antisemit? Einfach so. Also, um, Just like that. Why do I mention this example? It was clearly seen, especially in Germany, that such questions, which are of course very problematic from a media ethics perspective, are simply asked, are you an anti-Semite at the press conference? But it seems that in the German media landscape, it has become relatively unimportant whether one is skilled at their craft or not. The main thing is that one represents the right opinion. And the prevailing opinion was that this Congress was bad, and it had to be portrayed that way. Yes, at the press conference, the venues for the Congress were also announced. They were not known before because there were threats against the Congress. The police were already behaving very aggressively, even at the press conference. The police were very aggressive at the press conference. An activist hung the Palestinian flag on a scaffold opposite the room where the press conference was taking place and was arrested by the police for it. The conference was originally supposed to take place in South Berlin Tempelhof, near the upper town of Old Tempelhof. Registration was planned between 12 and 2 p.m. and the start of the conference was scheduled for 2 p.m. I arrived just before 2 p.m and learned that the police were denying entry into the privately rented premises. It was a private organizer who had rented this room, this hall. Due to security checks, I don't know, bomb checks or something similar, the police delayed the start by two hours. So from the beginning, there was a huge delay tactic so that the Congress could not take place as planned much later. Yes, and then came the second point. The police downgraded the capacity of the room, which was actually designed for 650 people to 250 people at short notice due to fire safety measures. They said only 250 people could enter, although the room was intended for 650 people. However, the people who had bought tickets were already there. Ultimately, it was decided to first let in the organizers and the groups that had booths. This included the faction of the left party and participants of the Junge Welt, where media partnerships had been formed. Some Palestinian groups that were selling scarves and T-shirts were also there. They were let in, and then the accredited media. The accredited media mainly included international media. From Germany, as far as I know, Junge Welt and Neues Deutschland were accredited. With the organizers and the accredited media representatives, the 250 seats were almost taken again. This means that practically everyone who had bought tickets was not let in by the police. I was accredited, went into the venue, which was on the first floor. As I went up, I saw that the whole hall was full of armed police officers. There were definitely 50 armed police officers in the hall, standing at the entrances and partly sitting in the spectator seats. I wondered why the police were present at all, since it was a private venue. I was even more surprised that they were armed. The reason for this was that the police declared the Congress a demonstration inside the building at short notice and explained that they had to be present at a demonstration. I had never experienced such a situation, an indoor demonstration where the police simply decide to be present in a private space. Moreover, the building was multi-story and had various rooms. 
I also learned that a prosecutor was sitting in an adjacent room, ready to distribute charges. He was monitoring the situation through cameras. Über Kameras mitverfolgt der Staatsanwalt und irgendwann um, bekomme ich. And at some point, I noticed that at the other end of the hall, the police had stretched a cordon tape behind the seats. Suddenly, numerous journalists who were not accredited came in. There were officially accredited journalists who had received a blue band and had registered on the accreditation list. However, the police allowed, under the pretext that it was a demonstration inside, and that media representatives were allowed at a demonstration, the entire German press and the Springer press into the hall through the back entrance. This happened against the organizers' wishes. There was great confusion, and it took quite a long time. Ja, also es war ein rechter Durcheinander, es hat ziemlich lang gedauert. Durch die Personenkontrollen hat der Kongress schon mal sehr spät begonnen. Ja. Due to the personal checks, the Congress started late. Before the welcoming words, a police announcement was read out in three languages, German, English and Arabic. It explained which symbols of banned organizations are not allowed to be displayed, that anti-Semitic statements and glorification of violence are prohibited, similar to the announcements made at the beginning of demonstrations. The police requested that the announcement should also be made in Arabic, but did not provide a translation. Therefore, it was spontaneously translated into Arabic. Das heißt, es war aus dem Stand in Arabisch übersetzt worden. Diese Übersetzung hat nachher der Polizei nicht gepasst, weil sie gemeint hat, dass manche Sätze nicht... This translation was not satisfactory for the police as they believed that some sentences were not correctly translated into Arabic. This meant that it had to be read out in Arabic again. It was thus a delaying tactic by the police to disrupt the smooth running of the Congress. Subsequently, the welcome speech briefly explained why the Congress was titled We Accuse and what it was about. It was about the fact that, based on a decision of the International Court of Justice in The Hague from January, which started the proceedings regarding a genocide against Israel at the initiative of South Africa, Germany has come under criticism for its support of Israel. Germany has supplied about one third of the ammunition that Israel has been using since the 7th. October come from German production. Therefore, our accusation is, Germany is complicit in genocide. After the welcome, the first plenary session began, which dealt with the history of Palestine over the last 75 years, since 1948, since the Nakba. First, a Palestinian journalist and historian spoke about her experiences and reported on the Nakba. Salman Abusita was supposed to speak next. He is a surgeon and currently the rector of the University of Glasgow. No, that is the father of the surgeon. Salman Abusita is the elder. You are confusing the father with the son. No, the surgeon who was supposed to speak directly is in Glasgow. He should have come. Yes, but Salman Abusita, that is Ghassan Abusita. Sorry, I know them both. The surgeon is Kassan Abu Sita, and his father, he is an 85-year-old historian, and he was supposed to speak via video. Exactly. So both should speak. Salman was scheduled for the first plenary to talk about the history of Palestine, and Kassan Abu Sita was supposed to speak in the evening at the last plenary. He spent several weeks working in hospitals in Gaza and was supposed to talk about his deployment there. His father, on the other hand, was supposed to report on the entire history of the Al Nakba and the oppression. <laughs> exactly. So he was on a mission for Doctors Without Borders in Gaza. Both were later banned from operating in Germany. Therefore, his speech had to be transmitted via video link. About a minute after the start of his speech, I was sitting in the middle of the room, opposite the stage, where the journalists were with their cameras. I saw how the commander of the police operation waved to his colleague on the other side, from the right side. Then they came from both sides to the stage, positioned themselves in a semicircle around it, 
and suddenly the power went out completely. So the lights and everything. Und der Strom ist ausgefallen. Ähm, komplett, also auch das Licht und alles. Das war, dass die Polizei hat den Strom gekappt. It was such that the police turned off the power. Initially, it was unclear what exactly was going on. The organizer immediately asked for calm so that they could negotiate well with the police about what was actually happening. Yes, we later learned that the power was cut to end the live stream. The police initially argued that they had to review the video before it could be played because of its content. Negotiations took place including with the lawyer. There was a team of lawyers at the Congress, and the lead lawyer, Nadia Samawad, also negotiated with the police in the hope that the Congress could continue and the video might be played later. After an uncertain period, probably an hour, or maybe even longer, possibly two hours, which felt very prolonged, the police finally announced that the Congress had ended and the hall had to be cleared. The reason given was that the live stream could reach a number of people in Germany, which would contradict the prohibition of activities of the two gentlemen. Subsequently, the clearing of the hall began. The organizers wanted to continue the Congress, but the public prosecutor's office immediately announced that any alternative events would also be prohibited. This means that the Congress could neither be moved to another location nor to another day. After we had left the room, there was also a group of Austrian activists mainly from students for the Palestine cause and the Darajanab Association. I stayed outside the event room for a while with other journalists and colleagues. At some point, I received a call from the Viennese who were in Berlin. They informed me that they had been arrested and I should come quickly. When I arrived, two of the Viennese had already been detained by the police on the street. After their identities were verified and their bags were searched, they were released. I was with this group, consisting of about 15 to 20 people, on the way to the Alt Tempelhof subway station. We were just walking along the sidewalk, while three police cars drove beside us at walking speed. At regular intervals, police officers jumped out of the cars, arrested individual people from our group, conducted an identity check, and then drove on. On the stretch of about 500 meters or one kilometer from the event location to the subway, people from our group were repeatedly snatched away for no reason at all. We were just on our way to the subway. Finally, when the group from Vienna entered the subway station, the police followed and made more arrests in the area of the subway. Im U-Bahn-Bereich auch noch Personen verhaftet. Und eine a person was arrested and searched by the police under the pretext of looking for weapons. We then consulted a lawyer from the legal team. He was able to clarify the matter so that the person could leave after about half an hour. However, it was pure harassment by the police. That was on Friday. On Saturday morning, the organizers announced another press conference. They invited the accredited media half an hour before the start and only then allowed the non-accredited ones into the room. As far as I could see, only RBB, Radio Berlin Brandenburg, came. Radio Berlin Brandenburg. War auch das Verhalten, muss man ganz ehrlich sagen, von RBB recht. The behavior of RBB was, to be quite honest, rather poor. They actually only filmed the room and the other journalists present, not the press conference. This only changed after the organizers pointed out for the third time that the press conference was taking place at the front, not the back. They were then asked to either film the press conference or leave the room, which they ultimately did. The press conference itself was very informative, with good questions and statements. Afterwards, a large protest rally took place in front of the Rotes Rathaus in Berlin, the main seat of the city administration. The rally was convened at short notice because the Congress was prevented. 
Before I go into what happened at the demonstration, I should also mention what happened on Friday night. Nancy Faeser, the German Minister of the Interior from the SPD, released a statement in which she criticized the behavior of the German police. She emphasized that it was not the Berlin police, but a unit of the riot police from Duisburg, North Rhine-Westphalia. This unit was also the one that later stormed the Congress. On Friday, a total of 900 police officers were deployed, although only 650 conference participants were registered. So, there were more police officers than participants present, with a specific unit of the riot police from Duisburg being in the area. She behaved correctly and well. This is also important in terms of the issue of opinion making, which I emphasized at the beginning. The organizers, namely the Jewish Voice for Just Peace and the TM25 party of Janis Varoufakis, as well as Nancy Faeser, have stressed that it is important to continue monitoring the Islamist scene in Berlin. Although it must be clearly stated that, if one looks at the program of the event and the speakers, they mainly came from the secular spectrum of Palestine, or tendentially from a secular, Arab nationalist, left nationalist spectrum of the organizers. Many left-wing, socialist and Trotskyist groups were involved. There was no indication that there were any connections to groups like Hamas or Palestinian Islamic Jihad. Therefore, the accusation that this was about the Islamist scene is completely absurd. On Friday, there were also two arrests in the event hall, and the two arrested individuals were Jewish faith activists from the Jewish Voice for a Just Peace. However, this information was not communicated accordingly in the German media. The demonstration then gathered in front of the city hall and was very large. People from Berlin have said that this was by far the largest demonstration this year. It then moved through downtown Berlin towards Friedrichstrasse. It was peaceful and loud. The organizers speak of 9,000 participants. I conducted an interview with the spokeswoman of the German police, Beata Ostertag. During her conference, she said that the numbers she received were at 1,900 participants. I myself would estimate that it could certainly have been 5,000 to 6,000. So whether it was 9,000, I don't know now, but it was large, especially for a demonstration that was registered at such short notice. There were constant confrontations and arrests by the police, several of which I also documented. The police were very aggressive in their approach to the demonstration. There was no obvious reason for why people were being arrested. During an arrest, me and other journalists, including two Spanish journalists working for a TV station in Qatar, as well as two journalists working for the Turkish media agency, went behind the police cordon with our press passes. It was a young woman who was being arrested. The German police always bring prison transport vehicles to such demonstrations. The young woman was put into one of these vehicles, and at some point, screams could be heard from inside. I documented this. She began to cry and shouted that she couldn't breathe. She suffered a panic attack and screamed quite a bit in the car. Subsequently, she was carried out of the vehicle by the police. Several times she vomited on the street and cried out that she couldn't breathe. Despite our indications, it took half an hour for a paramedic to arrive, even though we were in the middle of downtown Berlin, where paramedics are usually present at demonstrations. We tried several times to speak to the operation leader, as my journalist colleagues were also hindered in their work by the police, even after our press IDs had been checked. I also filmed the aggressive actions against the journalists to some extent. A squad leader was somehow not to be found. Apparently, he was no longer responsible. 
The young lady was vomiting continuously for almost 15, 20 minutes. The German police did not call a paramedic. We filed a complaint in which we expressed that we wanted to speak with the press office. Beata Ostertag, the press spokesperson for the German police, actually came after half an hour. At first, she wanted to speak with us off record. Then we explained that we wanted an official statement. Consequently, she had to consult with the command again to clarify what she could say publicly. She ultimately gave us a pretty meaningless statement. She said that there had been six arrests at that point. However, after she gave us the statement, I personally witnessed two more arrests. She explained that one of the reasons for the arrests was the attempted theft of a police camera and the attempt to prevent the police operation by other demonstrators. Yes, that was after the demonstration. It was a different demonstration, as she also confirmed. Again, 900 police officers from different regions of Germany, including North Rhine-Westphalia and Saxony, were involved. Although one really has to say that it was a thoroughly peaceful demonstration, I myself did not see any symbols of organizations that are classified as terrorist in the EU. So neither Hezbollah, Hamas, Fan, nor anything else was present at the demonstration. It was mainly, and this must also be said, relatively few Arabs there. There were a lot of German leftists present. So red flags, hammer and sickle, various Trotskyist and communist organizations were very strongly represented. Otherwise, only national flags like those of Lebanon, Yemen, Palestine were visible, but no Arab organizations. So, which forbidden symbols might have caused the arrests is not clear to me, and the police spokeswoman could not provide any information on that either. That was on Saturday. On Sunday, there was a live stream by the organizers, in which parts of the program were made up for. After that, I visited a protest camp in front of the German Reichstag in the park, a few days before the conference, a Palestine solidarity camp had formed there. There were a few dozen tents in which young activists camped and held events. Every day at 5.30 p.m., a rally took place, which according to the organizers, was attended by around 150 people. Opposite the Reichstag, three large banners were set up. One criticized the media coverage of the German media, another demanded the end of the genocide, and the third the cessation of German support for the genocide. Those were the three main demands. Here too, there was a huge police presence and harassment through the conditions imposed. One of the police's conditions was that only German and English could be spoken throughout the protest camp area. I heard that this regulation led to obstructions and even arrests because some Muslim participants were performing their prayers. Since these were not in German or English, it led to arrests. And ultimately, after my departure, the protest camp was partially cleared on Sunday evening because one of the speakers at a protest rally is said to have made statements that led to the arrest and clearing of the protest camp. I don't know exactly what was said. In summary, I am politically active in various forms, also in different countries. In many European countries, I have not experienced such aggressive police action in the last 25 years as I did in Berlin for three days. I have also spent a lot of time in Northern Ireland, where the police operate with armored vehicles and aggressively target peaceful activists. I have never experienced anything like this before. Thank you first for the report. The matter continues to be reported and discussed. For example, there are stories like the one about the former Greek foreign minister. One certainly cannot accuse him of being an Islamist fanatic. Nevertheless, he was issued a ban on residents and activities. I have looked into it, and legally it is not entirely clear what a ban on activities exactly means. 
rechtlich ein bisschen unklar ist, was ist eigentlich ein Betätigungsverbot. Also es scheint hier zu sein, einerseits das Bestehen... It seems that on one hand, existing legal possibilities are being exploited to the utmost. If these are deemed insufficient by the authorities, creative new restrictions are sought. According to leading German constitutional lawyers, these are obviously absolutely illegal, i.e. unconstitutional. That this comes from a social democratic foreign minister may not be so relevant in this context. Obviously, this is now the interpretation of what German raison d'etat means. The German raison d'etat simply means that Israel is supported unconditionally. This also includes, as mentioned earlier in the year, that support continues even during war, i.e. after the 8th. October continues to supply German weapons and ammunition to a warring army accused of causing genocide. It's really a very strange and concerning story. Hence my introduction to this presentation by the two media people. Gradually, certain actions being taken in Europe beyond what is happening in Gaza or similarly in Ukraine are becoming fundamental questions. It's about how far European governments are willing to question and indeed exceed constitutions, human rights, and fundamental freedoms which we always pride ourselves on being guided by values, etc., especially here in Europe. And that's why we've revisited this topic and examined it using a specific example, because the situation is really serious. There are increasing signs that European authorities, ministers and the police are suppressing or promoting political opinions at will, without regard for existing rules or principles. And that is something that should actually be recognized as a medium. This information is also being spread across our media. We notice this in the discussions on our YouTube channel as well. It's starting to catch people's attention, and they are rebelling against it. Of course, it would be a terrible thing if these actions actually provoke and trigger a political reaction that really isn't right for anyone. Because in reality, in Germany, but also partly in Austria, it's not the democratic center and those who respect human rights who benefit from this, but rather parties and groups that are predominantly on the far right and not on the left. So in my opinion, and our opinion, it is a very dramatic matter and one simply cannot carry on with business as usual. That was also the purpose of this conversation. We will continue to address these human rights issues in other contexts as well. It is no longer just about whether the actions of the Israeli army constitute genocide. That question is in the hands of international lawyers and jurists. Rather, it's about the implications for our system. There is a danger that an alliance between the political and journalistic mainstream is actually working on a gradual dismantling of democratic fundamental rights. One cannot really agree to that. Perhaps, if I may add something else. There were different things, for example, the expansion or overinterpretation of various laws and regulations. One point is that something in the private sphere is simply declared a demonstration. How far does that go? Imagine we are having a birthday party at home with 30 people, and suddenly the police are at the door saying they consider this an indoor demonstration and want to participate. And how far this extension goes, I believe, is made clear by the activity bans. The lawyer Nadja Samor briefly mentioned this, if I recall correctly, at the press conference on Saturday. The term activity bans has apparently existed since the 1970s, but was almost never used, only in exceptional cases, maybe once every few years. To my knowledge, there were exactly two cases in Germany before the weekend. These were used against Salafist preachers who recruited in Germany for Daesh, 
the so-called Islamic State. Now this legislation is being applied against the principal of the University of Glasgow and against a former Greek finance minister. Activity bans can be issued if the presence and activity of the person in Germany could endanger the liberal democratic basic order. This is concerning, especially when you consider against whom these measures were taken, a surgeon, a professor from Glasgow, and a critical finance minister. A prosecutor in Germany apparently sees these individuals as too great a threat to the stance of the liberal democratic basic order. These are very problematic tendencies that are particularly evident in Germany. Yes, in addition, Abu Shita is a dual citizen. He is a British citizen. As a Palestinian, he actually has no citizenship because as a Palestinian, he is stateless. He has studied, has been educated, and as mentioned, is a high-ranking academic official as the rector of a university. He is British, and Varoufakis, as a Greek, is even a member of the EU. This means that there is indeed a very broad interpretation of what could be done, and this is a point at which one really must apply the brakes. There are also plenty of other examples where there is a risk that certain countries or parties are immediately sounded the alarm, and then the threat to democracy in this or that country is proclaimed. Or freedom of the press is restricted in the concerned country. But the path that Germany is taking leads exactly in this direction, and people are acting accordingly. Regardless of whether it's about the right or the left, Palestinians or Jews, Iranians or Scots, what really needs to be at the forefront is the respect for human rights and the constitutional order. Otherwise, we could wake up the day after tomorrow and find that a kind of European dictatorship has been established again. This must not happen. In this sense, thank you very much for your report. Thanks also to our viewers for their interest and attention. We will certainly continue to follow this topic closely. There is also a pre-registration or announcement for the attempt to have another conversation with Professor Welzer. This is particularly interesting because he is a journalist, publicist, and scientist who is highly praised both internationally and in Germany. However, he is often pigeonholed because he confronts people who stir up trouble in mainstream media. The result of his scientific work shows that there are obviously paid journalistic actors whose mission is to influence people who are not yet fully aligned through lies, manipulation, and half-truths. In this sense, thank you very much, and see you next time.